wonderful time here this weekend? I have too. It's been really great to have like slumber party with girls. It's been a long time since I've done this, right? Yeah, we had a lot of fun. I've had a couple bumps and bruises along the way too, huh? Yeah, but that's good. That's like life, right? There's going to be some bumps and bruises in life. Um, and sometimes we're the one that needs picked up and to be carried along because we have the bumps and bruises. And sometimes we're the one that needs to do the picking up and the carrying along. And I think that's what we've learned a lot this weekend uh, from each of these ladies. I didn't introduce myself. I can introduce myself. Um, I'm Carrie. (laughs) My husband is Jeremy Elliott. Um, I do have four kids, Titus, River, Silas, and Shiloh. You probably know Silas. He's the one that everybody knows, right? He's the one that I told Mrs. Brown this morning, keeps me on my knees, keeps me praying. Lose my testimony with him every now and then, but you know, that's okay. He's a little sinner. I'm a big sinner. It's good. So um, yeah, uh, Jeremy and I, well, I've been at Temple since 2000. He's been at Temple since he was in the fifth grade. So yep, <laughs> Elena and Melissa grew up with him. So um, they've, uh, they've been there a long time. And um, we do love the Lord, and we love this church, and we've walked through this church through many, many trials, through many valleys, and up mountains. And so, you know what? The Lord has been faithful through all of those, and that's a blessing. So let's review a little bit of what we've learned this weekend. Uh, Melissa started us off with teaching us that um, the bridge... To unity is love and requires a complete transformation. And that transformation comes from our great and awesome God. He's that magic sauce that gives us that transformation, right? And then Sheila followed up and she encouraged encouraged us to love the Lord God um, and let that love overflow in our acts of service to others, right? Um, And then Margie, whoo, Margie meddled, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Margie said, are you forgiving? Because you've been forgiven, right? She reminded us that forgiveness is an extension of Christ's love. And that love should go through us to others. She challenged us to forgive because we are forgiven. Each and every one of us are created in God's image. Therefore, as image bearers, we are created to reflect in the image of God to others. Wow. So a huge and loving way To forgive is to forgive others, right? Uh, Margie reminded us that Christ died. Christ suffered. Christ gave. He willingly, lovingly gave himself for us. This kind of loving forgiveness we should show to others. You might say it's hard. Downright impossible. You'd be right. Alone on our own, it is impossible But through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, working through us, we can image our loving and forgiving Father, and we can forgive others. And so that kind of segues into the section that I'll be speaking on today, which is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our helper, our guide, our unifier. So this morning's message is going to come to us from Galatians. Galatians is one of the epistles. There's a big word, right? I like big words. I like to define them too, right? So an epistle is a big churchy word for letter. You know, those things that you get in the mailbox with a stamp that's like $2.57 now? (laughs) Paul wrote several of these epistles or letters to the early churches. He wrote them to encourage them, to ground them in their faith, to define their doctrine, and even rebuke them when sin was found. Historically, Galatians is thought to be one of Paul's first letters. When reading the book as a whole, it is evident that false teaching had begun to creep into the church. Paul's writing to admonish the church for their lack of discernment and encourage them in their faith by giving them clear direction on how to behave. The false teaching that was corrupting this infant church was not some heinous pagan act, but rather a quiet and insidious self-righteous need to follow the rules, specifically circumcision. The church was guilty of requiring rule-following 
more than freedom in the grace of Christ's sacrifice. They were teaching that circumcision was required to establish and maintain their standing before the Lord. We have a word for that today. It's called legalism. Legalism is seen as a stumbling block throughout all of Scripture. Legalism occurs when we are following rules to earn something or to impress someone. It's kind of more transactionary. Legalism occurs when our motivations differ from our actions. We only see what's on the outside, right? The Lord sees our heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7 tells us, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his outer appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. The Lord sees the heart, and that is the point that Paul is pressing as he writes Galatians. So before we dive into the word today, Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer one more time, okay? Let's bow our heads. Most gracious and heavenly Father, you are the author of all creation. You are an awesome and mighty God. Lord, as we sit here, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to your word. I pray that you would help us to glean what you desire for us to glean, Lord. I pray that you would use me to teach these lovely ladies what you desire them to know. Lord, I praise you for your word. I pray that you would use this time to let us see that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord, to remove that which we don't need in our lives and to reveal that which you desire. Help us to grow in your word. I say this in your precious holy name. All right, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Galatians chapter 5. Our session today will be from verses 13 through 26. Let's go ahead and start in Galatians 5.13. For you were called to be free, brothers and sisters. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be consumed by one another. Called to be free. Free from what? In Romans 6.15, Paul mentions being slaves to sin. Earlier in Galatians, Paul refers to laws as bondage. If they don't keep all the rules, they will be cursed. That's what it says in Galatians 3.9. The freedom found in Christ is freedom from both sin and the need to keep certain rules in order to be seen worthy before our Creator. None of us are worthy. No, not one. Paul continues, noting that freedom can be tricky too, right? Don't use your freedom in Christ as an opportunity for the flesh. Our flesh is dirty. Our flesh is sinful. Our flesh is wicked. We've learned this weekend from different ladies, our flesh is petty. Our flesh holds grudges, right? But we're going to go more into that in a minute, okay? Paul, like a loving parent, will give a warning and then follow it up with, this is how you should behave. So he'll say, don't do this. You should do this. And so he says, serve one another through love. He reminds us, as Jesus did, the whole law is fulfilled in loving our neighbor as ourself. And Melissa did such a wonderful job teaching us who our neighbors are. Everyone's your neighbor, right? First, those in your home, your husband, your kids, your parents, your siblings, then our communities, church, work, neighborhood. We are called to love. The Greek word here is agape. I also like foreign languages that have to do with the Bible. (laughs) Unfortunately, we don't have an English equivalent for the word agape. Agape is the love God shows man and expects man to show one another. What does it mean? Well, I'm going to quote one of my favorite authors because she so elegantly put it. Who knows my favorite author? Good job. You guys are so good. So Jen says, agape is love that is offered free of need. 
extended by a person whose need has been met in Christ and originating in a God who has no needs whatsoever. Because agape is not bound by need, it can be freely and lavishly given without fear that it might be more wisely spent elsewhere. Right? I'll repeat that a little bit. That means that to love each other freely and lavishly without fear that it might be used better somewhere else. God's love doesn't run out, so our love shouldn't run out. He will always refill us. But, I like buts in the Bible, right? Is it a good but or is it a bad but? (laughs) This one is a bad but. (laughs) But if you bite and devour one another, watch out or you will be consumed by one another. Paul doesn't literally mean that we're like biting each other, right? No, rather Paul is speaking metaphorically. He's saying if we use words to hurt each other and speak negatively of one another, then we will be consumed. We will be consumed by sin. These words are a warning spoken to a church on how to behave towards other members of the body of Christ. We should never speak negatively of others or speak harshly to one another. In true Pauline fashion, he always gives instructions on how to after he's rebuked us. So he rebuked us a little bit. So now he's going to tell us what to do. Let's continue in verse 16. So Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will certainly not carry out the desire of the flesh. Author Alexander Strzok sums it up well when he states, When conflict arises, our attitudes and behaviors should reflect our new life in Christ, given by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. When Christ was preparing his disciples for his departure, he reminded them that a helper, a counselor would come, one that will guide you in all truth. This is the same spirit that Paul speaks of here in Galatians 5.16. We can only love like Jesus when we walk in the spirit. When we walk in the spirit, we will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Two questions come to mind when I, when I hear that. One, how do we walk in the spirit? And two, what are the desires of the flesh? Funny you should ask. Let's read on. Verse 17, for the flesh desires what is against the spirit, and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. That's a lot, right? I'm warning you about these things, Paul says, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul here starts by answering that second question, what are the desires of the flesh? So the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Because the flesh is under the law. The flesh has works. Those are three things that he kind of points out there. Again, Paul is not literally speaking about our skin and our muscles and our our bones. Rather, he is speaking of our sin nature. That inheritance we received from the first Adam. Our desires that are contrary to God. He calls these desires works or deeds. The original Greek here is ergon. And can be translated as work task, deed, or action. Our sin nature produces a long list of offensive acts. I like lists. We have any lists, ladies, out here? Anybody like lists? Yeah, we're in good company because Paul likes lists. See, there you go. His list today is not necessarily exhaustive, but it is extensive. So that means that if you abstain from all of these things in that list, then you're good. No, it means that this kind of encompasses the things you should abstain from. If you look at it a little closer, I I happen to look at it in about five or six different versions. Most of them have 15 offenses in there. Some of them have 16. 
but all of them end with an all-encompassing, all things similar, right? So if you look at this list of badness, you kind of see three groups of offensive behavior. One is sexual sin. Two is idolatrous sin. And three is social sin. So let's look at these a little closer. Number one is sexual sin. This includes sexual immorality, moral impurity, and promiscuity. Sam Albury wrote an eye-opening booklet called, Why Does God Care Who I Sleep With? It's really good. You should, you should read it. It's pretty short. In, his, in this book, he lays out essentially that God cares because we're his ambassadors, his representatives to a dark world. Sin nature inclines us to follow our heart, right? Following your heart might look like sleeping with your boyfriend or following your desires and sleeping with a girlfriend. And I'm talking to ladies here. It can also look like self-pleasure through reading. You guys know the books I'm talking about, those books at the end of the checkout stand. Hmm? This, is, this is natural for us because we're sinners. But when we're filled with, this, with the Spirit, it shouldn't be natural anymore, right? And why is it wrong? Because it puts us in the self. It puts us as self-centered. It gives us what we want, and we're thinking only of ourselves. That's where the sin is. We need to think of others. We need to think of God. Sexual sin will look different for each person because each person is fearfully and wonderfully made. We are all image bearers of God, but we are also all sinners, right? All right, let's look at the second offensive behavior, idolatrous sin. This includes idolatry and sorcery. Seems kind of far-fetched, doesn't it? This can't be an issue today. Sorcery? Idolatry? We only hear about these in science fiction and when we read the Old Testament, if we read the Old Testament, right? I think if you look at Timothy Keller's definition of idolatry, it might hit a little closer to home. Timothy Keller, in his book, Counterfeit Gods, states, An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts. If I have this, then I'll feel my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. If I have this, then I'll know my life has meaning. I'll feel like I have value. I'll know I'm significant and secure. He defined it really well. And now idolatry is a whole lot closer to home, isn't it? It is. Culture today sells us counterfeits constantly. Counterfeit gods, right? If you get that degree, you'll be happy. If you get that promotion, you'll be happy. If you get married and have children, you'll be happy. If you can express yourself the way you want, you'll be happy. These are counterfeit gods, right? All right, let's look at the third offensive behavior, social sin. This includes hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. Ooh, that's a long list. Each of these create chaos in communities. They essentially elevate self above others and therefore consume others for personal achievement or enjoyment. As women, we know that outbursts of anger are a regular monthly occurrence. <laughs> they create all kinds of chaos in our home, right? Selfish ambition is when we grasp for personal accolades. We serve our families with no recognition. We just want that pat on the back for our hard work, for serving endlessly in the nursery, or cleaning up after social gatherings, or working really hard on events such as these. <clears throat> when we seek the praise of men, we are no longer doing all as unto the Lord, like it says in Colossians 3.23. When we seek the praise of others, we can easily become envious of those who have what we want, and we can become judgmental 
of those who aren't striving for what we are. I'll repeat that again. When we seek the praise of others, we can easily become envious of those who have what we want, and we can become judgmental of those who aren't striving for what we are. Both create animosity towards our sisters in Christ and are not loving. Factions and dissensions occur when we form cliques and choose sides on opposing matters. Those sides could be as simple as to nurse or to bottle feed, cloth diapers or disposable diapers, vegan or omnivore, <laughs> Democrat or Republican, right? They can create dissension. May it never be, is what Paul would say. May it never be. Mm -hmm. This is division. We can have different parenting philosophies and different political views and still reside in unity. When love overflows from the spirit, we can reside together. The last couple ones are drunkenness and carousing. And that really refers to those who kind of party all night. That's like a long time ago, right? Who can stay up past eight now? All right. <laughs> These works of the flesh are in opposition to, to the spirit. But take heart, my dear sisters. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This means that the Holy Spirit can help us to overcome these fleshly grievances. Galatians 5.21 reminds us that those who practice the works of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Just like in Margie's section, those who don't forgive will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. We want to have that glorious inheritance. So my question to you is, are you practicing any of the works of the flesh? Do you feel ensnared in one of these, trapped in the sticky mire of sinful desires? If so, I urge you to confess it to the Lord. Fervently pray that the Lord will deliver you from the works of the flesh. For you, Lord, are kind and ready to forgive, abounding in faithful love to all who call on you. Psalm 86.5. I also urge you to seek a sister that will help you. Ask a sister to bear with you, to strive with you, to help you break free. A sister who will also pray with you fervently. All right, so Paul has kind of told us what not to do. Now he's going to tell us what to do, right? He shows us that we are to live in a way that glorifies God. That is, abiding in the Spirit, like the song just said. To abide means to accept or live in accordance with. To live in accordance with the Spirit means to know the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Paul sums it up in Romans 12, too. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Abiding means renewing your mind. Paul wasn't insinuating that you head down to the local meditation temple and sit quietly to renew your mind or have a self-care day. He meant to get to know your Savior by studying to show yourself a worker that knows the way, the truth, and the life and is not ashamed. And that's my mashup of scripture right there. See, that's how that works. Jen Wilkins says it best. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. Does your mind know who the Lord is and what the Lord expects of you? If the answer is no, then I urge you to get involved in a Bible study. Get into the word of God and begin to see the transformation in your lives. You will no longer be enslaved to the works of the flesh. Rather, you will begin to see a new garden of works bloom. You will see the fruit of the Holy Spirit. With that, let's go on to verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
the law is not against such things. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. It's another but here, ladies. This is a good but. When we are walking in the Spirit, the evidence will be in our fruit. What we put in our hearts and minds will flow out of our mouths and be evident in our actions. James comments about this in his epistle. In James 3, 10 through 12, he states, Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring pour out sweet and bitter water from the same opening? James is telling us, look to nature. Look to nature to see how you should behave. Can a fig produce olives? My brothers and sisters, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt water spring yield fresh water. So a heart filled with the Spirit shouldn't have bitterness come out of it. That's what he's saying there. Paul has been rebuking the church at Galatia for their requirement to keep laws. Here, Paul is laying out that if we love the Lord and truly see him as our Savior, then we will desire to know him. As we get to know him, we will begin to reflect his character. The Holy Spirit will work in us and through us to glorify God. As we pursue the Lord passionately, then we will show evidence of the fruits of the Spirit. Keeping rules does not produce love. Obeying statutes does not bring joy. Following ordinances does not create peace in our hearts. These virtues are gifts from the Lord, brought to us by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at each of these fruits a little closer. Love. Agape. I talked about it a little at the beginning. This is the mark of new life in Christ. We love him because he first loved us. Because Jen Wilkin is so eloquent, I'm just going to use some of her book in his image because she really lays out agape. And you'd be really hard-pressed to say it any better than Jen. So I'm going to quote her, right? Okay. She might be my idol. I confess it. You guys pray for me. (laughs) All right. So she gives you three points on agape. Number one, and she compares earthly love to agape love. Number one, earthly love is based on need. But agape is given freely without fear of running out. Number two, earthly love covets reciprocity. But agape is given with no requirement that it be returned. And thirdly, earthly love weighs the worth of its objects. But agape love loves the unlovable at a great personal cost. So when I think of that, I think of Delphina and her ministry to the homeless. They can't repay her. They probably don't even say thank you. She does it anyways. She shows the love of God to the homeless in Paris. I also think of Johnette and Marvin and their love to the Navajo. They give. They don't expect in return. That's That's the love that God desires us to show to everyone. I'm glad our church has stellar examples of that, right? It's awesome. Our flesh tells us there isn't enough time or money or energy to love others. Our flesh screams, don't love them. They won't love you back like you deserve. But the Spirit says, love them anyway. Love them more. I'm going to refill you. Love them fully because I love you. Love them without prejudice because while you were still a wretched sinner, I died on the cross for you because I love you. So love one another. Joy. Joy is not happiness but rather that feeling of knowing that this suffering is producing good. Paul speaks most extensively in joy 
of joy in his letter to the church of Philippi, otherwise known as Philippians. We consider it joy when we suffer, specifically when we suffer for unity. How can we be joyful in suffering? I think of Stephen's face when he was being stoned in the book of Acts. His face was like the face of an angel. It shone with the Shekinah glory. He was filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit gave him the confidence to speak the truth in love and be forgiving even as they stoned him. Joy is produced by the Spirit and is evident when we suffer and our countenance is not broken. Peace. The calm that says it's going to be okay despite the chaos and terror all around. This can only come from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit shows us repeatedly that God is in control. All things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. We know that God is loving and kind, and so we have peace that his loving kindness will guide us through whatever trial we're going to face. Patience. Oh, can we skip this one, please? (laughs) When trials come that require us to be joyful and love those who persecute us, when all we want to do is curl up in a ball and cry or run. (laughs) Paul says, stay the course. Love like God. Forgive like Christ. This is so important, especially when interacting with others inside the church, inside your home, and to the world beyond. Kindness. This is linked to Christ's sacrifice for our sins. Christ shows the kindness of God in his sacrifice. It doesn't, being, it doesn't mean being nice to others when it's convenient for you. It means being kind to the point of a sacrifice. It means being kind when it's an inconvenience. Goodness. This is different from kindness. It means to live morally, to reflect godliness in our lives. Paul often uses the contrast of light and darkness. The goodness in our lives should be light to a dark world. Faithfulness. Steadfast, loyal, dependable. I'm going to cry, I'm sorry. (laughs) Faithfulness means that no matter what, we continue on, on in doing the work of the Lord. When things get tough, don't throw in the towel and give up. We don't quit on God or others because he doesn't quit on us. And I'll share a personal story on this one. My mom passed away uh, about two and a half, three weeks ago. And for 20 plus years, I prayed for her salvation. And I don't know, but what I do know is I serve a faithful God. And because I serve a faithful God, I can have faith that he heard my prayers. And I can have faith in my faithful God, who is faithful to all generations, including mine. And so when you're struggling with, does God answer prayers? God is faithful. God is faithful, ladies. So hold on and don't give up. And that's my encouragement for you for faithfulness. And there's tissues if you need some. (laughs) All right, gentleness. Our actions should be characterized as gentle. Not harsh or abrupt, but gentle, because they are seasoned with love. Even if you have a Silas, you must be gentle. (laughs) Self-control. Are we dominated by the desires of the flesh? Or are we able to restrain ourselves when temptations come our way? Clearly these fruits, oh sorry, clearly these fruits aren't something we achieve on our own. Rather, it is the supernatural indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean we aren't required to put forth an effort. 
Verse 24 tells us that we are crucifying, actively and continually crucifying the flesh. We must continue to crucify the flesh daily. When we walk in the spirit, then we belong to Christ and our flesh is crucified. Our flesh is crucified. That means sacrificed. Our flesh is sacrificed. That's painful. It's going to be painful, but that's okay. Earlier, I mentioned that what goes in eventually comes out. Christ says it most eloquently in Matthew 12, 34. For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. We cannot love what we do not know. Do you know what the Lord desires of you? The Lord does not desire a transactionary devotion. If you do this, then you will be right with the Lord. That's not what the Lord desires. The Lord desires that you love him with your whole heart, with your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. We can only love others when we have the Holy Spirit empowering us. Because sin has created us to contend with one another and to desire to overcome one another. That's what sin tells us. The Spirit says love one another. Forgive one another. As we wrap up this weekend, I pray that you have been encouraged, convicted, and renewed by the Spirit. I pray that you will purpose in your heart to serve the Lord. Serving the Lord alongside other believers will be evident in our love for one another, how we serve one another, and how we forgive one another. This seems like a daunting task, but our God is bigger. Our God is stronger and more generous than we can ever imagine. Our God doesn't just exhibit these traits, but his whole existence and being is composed of these traits. God is love. God is joy, God is peace, God is patience, God is kind, God is good, God is faithful, God is gentle, and our God is the author of self-control. He is certainly more than just these traits, but by no means is he less than. He is generous, and he gives us these gifts to share with others. Will you share with others? As we learn today, these traits are only exhibited when the pressure is applied. Suffering produces righteousness. Suffering reveals what is in our hearts. What's in your heart today? I'm going to finish up with a couple verses and then we'll pray. Galatians chapter 6, verses 14 through 16 says... But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross, and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. May peace come to all those who follow this standard, and mercy even to the Israel of God. Let's pray, ladies.